You are listening to the Tuesday edition of the Locked On NHL Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan from Locked On Senators alongside Mike DiStefano for Locked On Leafs. And although it's always a battle of Ontario on this show, we can come together and celebrate Team Canada winning gold at the World Juniors. We'll get into a full recap of the tournament, including a look back on the teams we drafted. Who had the better team now with hindsight being 2020? Then we'll turn our attention to the New York Islanders. Yes, they are still in the NHL. And for the first time this offseason, they announced roster moves, a few re-signings that we'll tell you about. And then as we do each and every Tuesday, we're going to draft this time our top wingers in the National Hockey League. That's on the heels of the NHL Network putting out their top 20 list. So we'll draft that and a whole lot more. This is the Locked On NHL Podcast, your team every day. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making the Locked On NHL podcast your first listen on this Tuesday, August 23rd. We are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way you can help the show grow is to subscribe to the Locked On NHL channel. We are getting oh so close to 1,000 subscribers. Be a part of our journey and go subscribe to the Locked On NHL podcast. It's where we have local experts on the biggest stories five days a week, all the way through the offseason, because we know you diehard fans Need your hockey fix each and every day. Today, every Tuesday, I should say, it's the Battle of Ontario edition where we cover the Eastern Conference. I'm Ross Levitan. You can find me over at Locked On Senders, and I'm with Mike DiStefano from Locked On Leafs. Mikey, you still celebrating Team Canada or what? Before we get into this, because I know you're going to bring it up at some point, so I might as well bring it up at the start here so I don't <laughs> get blindsided. Did you want to gloat about your, I'll give you props, Pretty solid meme that you created you. the other day. I don't know if you can throw it up on the screen or something like yeah, that. we got it. Like, you you know, Locked On Sends. There it is for watching on YouTube. Locked On. Ross, the host of Locked On Sends, always likes to get, uh, the well, people get going. gets the people going. A little bit of a fire starter up on, uh, up on the old Twitter. Gaslighter, potentially, is a term that gets thrown around. But I got to give it to you, man. It's pretty good, right? The, Thank it's, you. It's Thank the, you. The, the Mason McTavish meme where McTavish, game seven, Leafs is the puck, the second round's the net, and it's McTavish knocking it down, saying, I don't think so, uh, en route to Canada's gold medal win. But I'll give it to you, pal. It's pretty good. I got a note from Dave when you posted. He's like, we got to respond. I'm like, Dude, how? How? There's no response to that. <laughs> Honestly, I'd love to, but like, there's no. What am I gonna say? Oh, how's the? You know, you haven't made the playoffs in five years. Well, the year before that, you made it to the conference final. So it's yeah, really too- not that easy to to respond to that. I mean, you could say, well, how's uh, the lottery been the last five years? That yeah, it's been okay. It's yeah, I guess so. You've been able to build out a decent squad. So unfortunately, there will not be a response from Lockdown Leafs. Kudos to you. It was, it, it, it was a really solid meme. Um, went viral, too. What did you end up getting? Like, over 1,000 Four, 14, likes. 1,400 likes so far. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Yeah, all good. But the beauty of it, and if I could have had a little more time or a little better thought, I would have put the Leafs logo over Leafs prospect, Topi Niemela's head as Leaf oh. fans would be staring at the puck. But I should give Topi Niemela props. Him and Roni Rivonen. Two uh, prospects who were traded from picks the Senators had. Both had great tournaments for Team Finland. Although, you know me, I like my old school tough and rumble hockey. So I'm not here to throw any mud at the K train. Tyler Clevin, the guy who Ottawa traded up with those picks to go get. How did you do the tournament? Uh, Not great. No, I didn't didn't think Team USA looked that strong at all. I mean, they lose to Czech Republic. He was third in ice time among defensemen. But he's never going to be a guy that contributes offensively with jaw dropping numbers no points do you see him take a run at that one kid though right at the penalty ball or at, right at the bench he's just he's a torpedo out on the ice he's going to be a bottom pair guy i think at, at his peak but a guy where the other team has to know where he is on the ice i think in a perfect world he's like that josh manson type defenseman but i don't know if his puck skills will ever 
meet that requirement. So I think a low bar, and maybe Sens fans will know this reference, maybe not others, but I see like an Eric Griba type defenseman out of uh, out of Tyler Clavin. I mean, That's a sexy name. Definitely no, not a sexy name. Hey, he he wow. started the fire in a playoff series against Montreal with a huge hit on Lars Eller in 2013, really? where then Paul McLean went back and forth. The bug-eyed fat walrus was uh, walrus. thrown out there. The line brawl in game three. So, he's hey, in that, Toronto now, eh? The walrus. He's like a... He was an assistant coach yeah. there, right? Yeah, yeah he's hilarious. like a power play assistant. And yeah, he had like that one awesome line about the demons in the in the docu-series that the Maple Leafs had last year with the, on Amazon, all or nothing. It was like the demons, they're everywhere. They're under their bed. They're in the shower. They're everywhere they look. <laughs> it was... It was a pretty good line. I was like, I didn't even know he was with the Leafs. And then, boom, there he is in the middle of my screen on the Leafs docuseries. It's like, oh, look at that. The Walrus with Toronto. Paul, Paul McClain, um, yeah. There was, a, there was shirts right after Brandon Pruss had, had that sit- statement in the 2013 playoffs. Whereas, don't. And then the mustache was covering an F-bomb with the wall with the Paulrus, they call them. Ah, there. So, good, good content there out of Paul McClain. Uh, Jack Adams, trophy winner in 2012. Yeah. But... Um, great Nova Scotia boy as well. That to say, uh, he used to be a stud with the Winnipeg Jets actually as well before starting his coaching career. Um, but we also got to see a ton of great talent from across the country. And as we can come together from that meme into the gold medal game, may as well start with that play because as you were telling me off air, people are going to remember that play more than the Kent Johnson gold yeah, medal winning goal. Absolutely. Like I, I did first up this morning and we spent more time talking about that play than we did talk about Kent Johnson. I may have said Kent Johnson's name one time the entire day, and that's the man who scored the golden goal. Typically, he's the one who's going to get all the fanfare, but like Mason McTavish, but just like that entire sequence, go back to McTavish's blown pinch on the blue line, on the yeah. offensive blue line. And then he gets tripped. On one, three on one on the way back, and then a great save by Grant, and then he gives the puck up. I don't know why he played it. I would have held on to that puck. You're the goalie between us on the show. Probably a safer decision to hang on when there's three of the other people's jerseys around you and no other defensemen. But anyways, got away with it there because Mace McTavish came back, saved the day. I still don't know, like, 99 times out of 100 on that play, that puck up, that puck ends up in the back of the net. Yeah, it's 999 puck- out of 1,000. Probably, probably, because that puck was well on its way in, right? Like you said, even after he hit it. That's what I mean. Like, look at everything that happened in that play. A, it's a bit of a fluttering puck, and he hits it so perfectly that it doesn't, like, go one way or the other and then goes in. Like, it doesn't deflect in. It It goes like a basketball. down, bounces right down, and then just, like, stays stagnant. Doesn't bounce in doesn't bounce out and hit a body. And then there was like sticks waving at it to try and get it out. There's like two or three times where both he and Bedard kind of whacked it. Luckily didn't hit it into the net. They just Amazing. whipped right over it until eventually McTavish was able to swipe it off the line and clear the zone. And then a couple minutes later, Stan Coven makes a nice little pet play to go down the ice and gets the pass to KJ who follows up his rebound and puts it in the back of the net. But man, it was honestly like such an amazing sequence like a lot of people hate three on three overtime but for international play i think it's proper and i was so entertained the the like that entire sequence was just fantastic to watch and maybe i think a little differently if canada ended up on the other side (laughs) of it but because they ended up victorious stoked about it i thought that it was it was great but canada was the better team they're the best team at the tournament they deserve to win gold right from the get-go so uh glad to see him finally kind of pull through but like finland credit to them they kept in that game and brought it to overtime they were what seven for seven on the pk yeah like Canada had so many opportunities to end that game and they didn't allowed finland to hang around in the third period they are able to come back score a couple goals take it to ot basically have the game winning goal well on its way before the mctavish play and then a couple moments later it's in the back of their own nets and canada's celebrating gold Fantastic to see from a couple of Canadians such as you and I. Mason McTavish played 26 minutes and 50 seconds in that game. The captain of the team, the MVP of the tournament, and quickly 
becoming my favorite player outside the NHL. He just plays yeah. such a hard nosed game, but then all of a sudden these like little spurts of skill come out. That one timer he had in the semifinal after he whiffed on it, broke his stick, goes back to the bench, gets a new one. And then from the exact same spot, fires home a shot. Unreal. What was the time on ice? You have the sheet in front yeah. of you, the green sheet. What for was the, the gold medal ice? game. For, for Zellweger in that game. Zellweger, again, early second round pick where it's just like, how did this guy the Ducks. fall out of the first round? By the Ducks. Oh, yeah. And that was, so they got McTavish and Zellweger in the same draft. He played 24 yeah. 30, had an assist, 26 shifts plus two. Man, McTavish led the entire team in ice time. Forget forwards. Like this guy was leading by example. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of power play time also, Fair. right? With seven power plays, they, they had a lot of opportunity to get out there and play some easier minutes. But, yeah, I mean, that guy was outstanding. And uh, we did a draft a couple weeks ago. Right yeah, before neither of us the... had him. Excuse me? You had Zellweger? Oh, Zellweger. Sorry, yeah. I thought you were talking about McTavish. No, I no, did not. Have no, no. I wish I had Zellweger. In hindsight, I wish I uh, I definitely would have taken him. But, um, no, he was he, – but he was outstanding, man. If I want – if I'm thinking about a player in that tournament who surprised me and, like – their stock rose throughout that tournament. I think Zellweger might be up at the top of the list. Like Mason McTavish, third overall pick, um, you know, coming back. I knew he was going to be the, you know, the guy He's going to be the captain. I knew he was going to have a fantastic tournament, but Zellweger kind of, kind of nowhere for me became the top player, the top defenseman, a horse. I was speaking with James Duthie from TSN today. And he said Zellweger's game in the gold medal match gave him like Thomas Shabbat vibes for yeah. how well Shabbat played a couple of years back when it was like he versus McAvoy. Zellweger yeah, he, he's was, actually, he's the only defenseman to ever win MVP of the world juniors, Shabbat. Yeah, and he was, and deservedly so. He was outstanding. Yeah. But Zellweger was, you know, just as impactful on both ends of the ice as Shabbat was a couple of years yeah. back. And uh just goes to show it's pretty good company for a young uh, Ren- uh, Zellweger to be. I was going to call him Renee. It's only <laughs> <laughs> cousin of Renee, I hear. Um, but, yeah, that man, it's crazy. Anaheim's got an embarrassment of riches. Of- I know. I just want them to be bad for one more year. I want them to get one of these high picks. Obviously, Bedard and McTavish have great chemistry playing together. Oh, uh, did you see – uh, oh Did you God. see Kent Johnson – and Bedard, apparently they've been playing hockey together since they were like 12 or 13 years old. And there's there's pictures like progressively from them as young as eight or nine and then 12 or 13. And then now all winning different medals at different events together. So that was pretty cool. And for me, He's you mentioned what? two years older than Bedard. Well, yeah, you don't think Bedard exceptional status is playing a couple yeah, of years yeah. up. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so there's that for me. I'll just give a quick stick tap to Logan Stan Coven. 10 points in seven games. And what he did when Ridley Gregg went out of the lineup, all of a sudden he started getting a little bit more of the offensive opportunities because they moved McTavish into more of like, I'm going to shut down the top line on the other team as well, which was what Ridley Gregg was doing. Two-time player of the game, by the way. But uh, what he was able to do, Stan Coven, and then even just on that game winning goal, the gold golden goal, like to stick with it after he gets hit off the puck, the little yeah. backhand feed unreal and again a guy who was stolen in the second round because he's under six feet tall logan stanko and the dallas stars have been drafting incredibly as well that's the other thing about mctavish though that like i i almost forget about the fact that when ridley greg went out he had to get moved into a checking role he still finished just one point shy of the canadian record with 17 points the record of 18 um oh man why is it a throwback name or is it more yeah No, it's a throwback name, but he tied. Who did he tie? Gretzky and somebody else. Maybe Lindros. Maybe Lindros. I was gonna say Lindros. 17. That's just sick. Yeah, but uh, imagine if he, you know, Ridley Gregg didn't go down, and he was able to stick with Bedard the whole time and and be an offensive weapon. Guy would have had twenty to twenty five points. Dale McCourt and Braden Shen are both tied with eighteen points in a single World Juniors. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. And Zegers so. had it last year, had 18 points. So McTavish won less of his future Anaheim Ducks teammate. Yeah, yeah. Unreal. A good team, man. Good team. What's our, Unreal. What, do you have uh, our uh, draft? Do we want to take a peek? I do. There? Let's do get a quick team? word. It's, a, it's an important word, a PSA coming up, and then we'll get to our World Junior Draft. We'll rehash that. 
we say we aren't going to talk about the World Juniors, but man, it's such a fun tournament, and especially with these prospects. So we had to get into that. We will touch on the New York Islanders and then get into our draft for this week. But first, Mikey, you got an important word from our friends at, well, stay sober or get pulled over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, sometimes you're hanging out with some friends, you're putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many, and as the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling for a ride. Nah, you live nearby, you can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you kill someone. Yeah, everyone knows the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel uh, while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on the roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive through a few drinks, think again, play it safe, plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. All right. After that very important word, we'll get back to our world junior draft. Mikey, let's um let's analyze your team first i mean you had team mvp tournament mvp mason mctavish and you had the best goalie in the tournament in jesper wallstead i'd say that's a pretty good start with your first two picks and one of the best defensemen too in topi nimala out there and i mean luke hughes did you see the way that that guy was playing on one leg impressive One leg in that i'm sure game. if you're a new jersey devils fan though you were like completely tensed up watching every move well, saying, is he going back to michigan he's going he's back to michigan back. but you don't yeah. want that to to fall you know great stat they had on the broadcast and tsn just does such an amazing job in canada broadcasting this every single year but what uh, i will say is when it comes to um to luke hughes at Michigan, they said he led all defensemen in the country in scoring, and he did it as a freshman last year. Now, yeah. you can say he had some pretty good talent up front. Kent Johnson, Matty Beniers, Owen Power passing the puck to him on the blue line, but still super impressive. Yeah, absolutely. So he's going to go back and hopefully have just as impressive a, a sophomore campaign. But I thought he still had a decent tournament. Uh, but overall, the Americans we talked about in the last segment, a, a very underwhelming tournament at events. So Logan Cooley and my guy, Matthew Nice, uh, didn't really get a whole lot done. Nice left goalless at the tournament. Just three assists, three points. That's all he was able to muster up. Uh, not able to find the back of the net, which was incredibly um, disappointing for a lot of Leaf fans. And, and reading you know, a lot of the um, post-tournament coverage when they look at you know the disappointment list, Nice seems to be coming up on a lot of these disappointment lists, so it's unfortunate. But when you get Mason McTavish out there on your team, it kind of makes everything worth it. So yours might be tough to beat there, pal. Yeah, it certainly is. I had a couple swings and misses as well. Obviously, Logan Cooley, uh, he tried to pull off the Michigan early on in the tournament. This guy's got a ton of skill. I'm excited that he's going to school, though. Like He needs, I think, a little more physical maturity. Minnesota's going to be a great place where he's going to actually get to play with Matthew Nye. So those two, uh, not only line mates on your uh, draft team, but they're probably going to be line mates this year as gophers uh, in the Big Ten. So that'll yeah. be pretty exciting for you to follow along. My team here is Connor Bedard, 1-1. Easy first overall pick. Although you can make an argument, Mason McTavish, but Bedard, that shot is ridiculous. He's probably a little trigger happy at times, though. Eh? He just shoots yeah. absolutely everything. I had like eight, eight to ten shot attempts a game, per yeah. game. It was unreal. But, hey, we're that good at ripping the puck. I mean, do it as much as you want, my king. Yes, 100%. Uh, Seaman Evanson was my next pick. A pretty disappointing tournament from him overall. The Swedes overall. Like, without Wallstead, they probably aren't even competing and winning bronze in this tournament. However, it did come out that he got food poisoning during the tournament. So, I guess we'll give him a little bit of a pass. I don't think that the Red Wings are concerned at all. I think that they're excited to see him come into training camp and earn a spot, maybe even in the top four uh, as of an NHL roster, but not a great tournament for him. Would they be concerned that your number one goalie, Sebastian Kosa, didn't yes. play after? Sick what, call by what, me. <laughs> I mean, you you decided that you were so gung-ho about Kosa. Well, I took him last in the draft, although I, once you had a goalie, it didn't really matter, but still. No, but like, are you surprised that we didn't see more of him? I mean, yeah, a little bit. 
Grand took the job and ran with it. Didn't give the net back once. Yeah, I mean, he's 20 years old versus a guy who's about to turn 19. But even still, Kosa, I think we'll see in December as the starting goalie. But he, yeah, it's definitely not ideal. Especially when you, if you're Stevie Y, you took Kosa over Wallstead. And Wallstead certainly played and played well. However, I think I make up for it here with Brock Faber getting him and uh, on the decor. He was not on the ice for a goal against for Team USA, and he led all defensemen in in uh, time on ice. So that tells you what you need to know. Him, obviously, he and Luke Hughes are both uh, a pair with Team USA. Kent Johnson, the Golden Goal, he had a great tournament as well. And then Liam Ogren was kind of invisible all tournament. Uh, that was that was really just a swing and a miss on on my point here. I'm pulling up his stats. I don't even know if he got a point. The entire tournament. And that was probably on me too. This has been like a 19, 20 year old tournament. And I took a guy who just got drafted and yeah, one assist in seven games. Sick call by me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we both had a couple of swings and both had a couple of players go out there and uh, perform mainly all the Canadian guys. We took everyone yeah. else didn't do much. We should Canadian have learned our lesson and well. just only taken team Canada players. That would have been a fun little bit. We probably could have. And would have had better teams, I suppose. I could have had Garand over Wallstat and still would have had the better goalie. Yeah, way to go, dude. Sick, <laughs> sick call by me. No, um, great tournament, though. We're not going to have to wait much longer until we get another World Juniors. Four months until Team Canada will look to defend its gold, and it's in one of the best places to have a World Junior, one of the best junior towns in North America, one of the best hockey towns without an NHL team in the world. Halifax, Nova Scotia, and it will be shared with Moncton, New Brunswick. So uh, all the East Coast buys, they'll be out uh, cheering in full force there and then partying on Argyle Street after. Not much better than that, heading out to Pizza Corner. But uh, before that, the NHL season will be underway. The NHL Network put out its top wingers, left and right wingers. We can all come together, put our differences aside. And draft our best wingers. But first, Mikey, I want to get your take on Noah Dobson's new contract with the Islanders right after a quick word from some of our favorite sponsors. All right, you're listening to the Locked On NHL podcast. I'm Ross Levitan. You can find me over at Locked On Senators. And I'm alongside Mike DeStefano from Locked On Maple Leafs. We've got a great season preview in the works coming up in the next few weeks. But Lou Lamarello finally realized that he's able to change up well, at least re-sign guys. He hasn't changed his roster at all. A team that was 18 points out of the playoffs. But Noah Dobson gets a three-year contract with an annual average of four, $4 million. Your initial reaction, hey, it's a bit of a steal? I actually like the deal, yeah. I thought that uh, getting him for $4 million bucks, it, it was was really good. I thought that he was going to come in roughly around the five and a half to $6 million range on like a four or five-ish year deal. But it's only getting him for $4 million. And knowing that that team was pretty much up against the cap, I thought it was actually a pretty savvy move there by uh, by old Lou Lamorello. Yeah, I thought it was nice. And what, what you're getting with Dobson, though, so it's nice, but at the same time, if I want to be critical of it, I would say that bringing him up to age 25 isn't very ideal, uh, especially you look at a guy who just exploded offensively in what was his third full season in the NHL. 51 points in 80 games. Kind of a low-key 51 points, especially yeah. on an Islanders team that had some low-scoring games. He was actually third on the team in points, only yeah. behind Brock Nelson and Matthew Barzell. Yeah, I, I wonder now, too, with the addition of Romanov, if, if that's going to affect his point totals at all. I wouldn't think so, but well, you never know. I mean, but, he, was play, he was carrying around the corpse of Zidane Chara for much of last year. Yeah, like, he really was. He really so was. So I think that there's some room for, for that number to even climb higher. I hope so, man. I've, I've liked Dobson for a while. I think that he's a terrific young uh, young player. And, and look, I, I just think that for $4 million, I mean, Erica Branson's playing under a $4 million <laughs> contract to, you know, tag this year. So... Who are you going to take? You know, I, I know that there's a lot of people out there that sit there and they say two, two complaints that people are making about this contract. One, you know, you're you didn't sign him long, long term. So you might have to pay him in three years a lot more money than what he's getting right now. And yeah, for sure. Still but an the, RFA, though, at the end of the contract. Exactly. Still an RFA. So you didn't walk him to free agency. And um, the cap is supposed to go up astronomically three years from now. Right. So it should 
work out okay. And when you look at cap percentage, it should be a relatively healthy bump, but not one that's insurmountable, I think, for the Islanders once the cap uh, definitely rises. And then also, you know, you, you could look at it and you could say to yourself, eh, you know, he was an RFA with no arbitration rights. How was he able to get so much money? Well, he also had a 50-point season. So he's just a good, <laughs> good freaking defenseman, and good yeah. players want to get paid and should get paid at that. So uh, I have no qualms, no issues with the way that Lou went about business with this deal. I thought it was pretty nifty and uh, a savvy piece of business there by all Lou Lamorello. You mentioned Alexander Romanov. They acquired him in exchange for a 13th overall pick that was ultimately – we flipped to Chicago. Yeah, they drafted Frank Nazar, and, and Montreal ends up getting Kirby Dock in a three-way trade. Kirby Dock still without a contract. He's an RFA, but Romanov signs a three-year deal with an average of 2.5. I think that's a safe bet. Uh, kind of a high floor, low ceiling type defenseman, at least from what we've seen so far in the NHL. One of those types of defensemen, though, that you have to keep your head up when he's on the ice. He's thrown some huge hits, but uh, if you want to go look up his one NHL fight, you might want to practice that josh norris fed him his lunch there uh last season but when it comes to uh to that yeah i'd say pretty low risk on that no oh yeah for sure i'm two and a half million dollars for somebody who you're hoping can be a top four defenseman yeah it was a three-year deal as well no correct yeah so i mean for the next three years to be paying him that you're expecting him to move into a top four role if not this year next year for sure and at two and a half million dollars i mean that's that's an exceptional deal there so you know, I'll credit Lou for all of these signings. They signed Kiefer Bellows as well. Mm-hmm. I think $1.4 million. Yep. Rather cheap contract for a guy who's going to play in your bottom six, um, who has a little bit of skill to play on um, the power play if you want a little bit. But I, I really do think that it was a nice little uh, nice summer. Well, it's been a terrible summer mm-hmm. for the Islanders, right? They were in on Goudreau, whiffed, in on Kadri, whiffed. Uh, finally, they announced something good with this team. and. Yeah actually seems to be some some nice healthy contract extensions to some of the young up and coming core and when it comes to the islanders they and their defensemen they don't have to worry about a top pair because they got one of the best ones in the league with pelic and pullock so you're really just kind of a layering beyond that and i think that they're two good upside bets especially obviously dobson's already there as a guy who can contribute on the first power play unit i'm more worried about the forward core and the aging forward core of the New York Islanders. I don't think we're going to see any of them drafted. We're going to do our classic. You know what? Here, let's let's uh, break this down on air because we haven't discussed. Are we going to do our typical four each or do we do eight and make it so that we've got four pairs of wingers? Uh, where are we at with time? We're at a half hour, so maybe we just do four each. All right. All right. Sounds good. Um, would you like to go first? I would say that you won the Team Canada, or so the Team Canada may as well have been, but the World Junior Draft basically by having team the tournament MVP on your roster and then kind of supplanting that with the goalie of the tournament. So you, you get the choice whether you want to go first or if you want to go second and third. Oh, oh, man. Let me see what we've got in terms of players here. You know, and I'm going to go first because I think you could still get interesting a player at four. I am yep. going to go first because I think there's only one answer at number one, and he's the best winger in the NHL currently. It's Nikita Kucherov. He's ah, still yes. Unbel- an unbelievable player. Like, people forget that like, how good this guy really is because he's been hurt the last couple of years a little bit, but – I mean, he's still arguably the best player. This guy can shoot the puck. He's an unbelievable playmaker. Nikita Kucherov is the number one pick for myself in our winning draft. I mean, the only thing you need to to prove your point is the playoffs the last three seasons. Yeah. Like 34 points, 32 points, and 27 points. That, like a third line winger, will put up that in like three quarters to a full season in the National Hockey League. He does it in a Stanley Cup playoff run three times in a row you can even go back when they made the finals there uh a few years back uh, earlier and he had 17 points that playoff run this guy is just he steps up in the biggest moments yes that was a no-brainer first overall pick um in this draft so you're taking nikita kucherov at number one i'm between a couple guys here but i have a couple choices so now it's just like who do i want to give the um what do i say not morale the uh, distinction of being the second overall pick are we do this is just like right now for this upcoming season right 
Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go with David Pasternak, who might be a little bit of a dark horse here, but I just think he's such a stud, man. You put that guy in his spot in the power play, I think he really changes. You always talk about how that's one of the best lines in hockey with Bergeron and Marchand. Not to take anything away with them, especially, I mean, Bergeron, two-way guy, but I don't think they put up nearly the points they do if it's someone other than David Pasternak up there at left wing. Yes, last year I would call it a little bit more of a, a down year for David Pasternak, but guess what? Contract year. Contract year alert, Mikey. I think this upcoming season, you're going to see him really step up. And this is a guy who I think in the past, he's hit 40 goals as recently as last year. Two years ago, I had 48 goals. I'm going to call my shot right now. With the return of David Krejci, and I'm not saying they're going to play together, but it's going to do a little something in the morale department. Pasta's hitting 50 goals this year. Oh, 50. Pasta's hitting 50 goals no, this year. No, I can year. see that. Abs- yeah, if he... If he stays healthy and if he plays the whole year, I could yeah. see Pasta hitting 50. I think Pasta's it's about time. 50. He's he's the, the type of player who can do that type of damage if he yep. plays the whole year. So hopefully, you know, he doesn't slip and fall on a, on a curb outside getting at a cab, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't we can't have that. But seven yeah. goals in seven games for Czechy at the World Championships. Again, 40 goals this past season in the National Hockey League. David Pasternak is my first pick and the second overall pick and maybe it's because i didn't want to go back to back russians to start the draft but i gotta go with my guy you know i was pushing for him to be in the mvp conversation this year it's Karel the thrill kaprizov out in minnesota talk about the difficult task of making minnesota an exciting team to watch and, and appointment viewing on tv that's what this kid did with 108 points 47 goals last year and then what does he do in the postseason seven goals in six games almost willing Minnesota by himself out of the first round. He couldn't quite do it. The goaltending wasn't great. The PK was absolutely atrocious. I think the power play was, their special teams just fell apart in the playoffs for Minnesota, but he is honestly the type of player that you go and you buy tickets just to see him. He certainly is the thrill. And in only what was his second season in the NHL, I think he has a chance to even do better with a full season alongside Matt Boldy and a couple of the other guys who Minnesota has coming up. I love Kirill the thrill here in this spot at third overall. We're definitely doing an A-player draft. Now that we're into it, I definitely want to do an A-player draft. So we'll keep it going. And I got eight total or eight each? Eight total. It's like four pairs. Yeah, yeah, four each. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, With my next pick, look, you're going to call me a homer on it, but I'm going with Mitch Marner. Yeah. I'm going with Mitch Marner. I mean, like this is – there was times this year where I sat there and I said to myself – is he the best winger in hockey? Like, could the Maple Leafs possibly have the best winger and arguably the best centerman in hockey with those two uh, on the same line? And look, there was uh, the back half of the year. He came back from COVID on January 15th, I think. And from then on, like nobody had scored more points than Mitch Marner from that point on that year. He had an outstanding season. Um, And it's not just offensively, like the guy kills penalties and is an avid penalty killer as well. A lot of people, you know, wouldn't think that about Mitch Marner because he is such a a point producer and an offensive dynamo. But the guy is so good at killing penalties literally out there. And they force a lot of like two on ones and get a lot of shorthanded opportunities as well because he's out there shorthanded with a little bit more ice. So um, Mitch Marner to me uh, is is a lot more polished as a, a 200 foot player than people give him credit for. So I'm giving him my fourth overall selection here in this winger draft and the fourth best winger in, in the NHL. And with the next pick, this is where it gets interesting. There's like a lot of different options here that I could yep. go with. Um, I like that you brought up the penalty killing because that is a an aspect here that Mar- Mitch Marner has that nobody else in our draft so far brings to the table. No, and, and with the next pick, I think... I think I'm probably gonna go revert back to uh, offensive dynamo. You know what? No, legacy pick. Got to be a legacy pick. Uh, Alexander Ovechkin is still at the top of yep. his game. I mean, Fair. that guy's still there. 50 goals this year, as what 36, 37 years old. Yep. Like the guy's still an absolute ox um, out on the ice, and I think he'll have another 50 goal season this year too. Why not? Doesn't yeah, show me not? any reason why he can't. So. Um, you know, puts his body on the line, runs through guys. He's a, a fantasy darling too, because if you if you're in a categories league, 
shots, goals, and hits. Gives you all three of those things. It's awesome. Um, so I'm going to actually go with Alex Ovechkin with my next pick and my fifth pick overall in this draft. Yeah, I like that. Um, I feel like we're almost doing a disservice now, not having one of the leading scorers in the National Hockey League, the top scoring winger of this past year, a guy who just got paid handsomely. Johnny Goudreau has to be off the board now at this stage in the draft. I, I think that what he's going to bring to Columbus, like you just saw a glimpse of what Kent Johnson can do um in the world juniors like if you put those two together they're just going to work so much magic down low at the nhl level but Goudreau doesn't really even need the help but it would be nice to have it obviously he had a great line to play on in calgary too but i love the way that he can control the pace of the play and his finishing skills are super underrated we ever know he's a great playmaker but he's also a sick sick shooter so i've got uh, johnny Goudreau here and uh again i go back to maybe a little bit of bias and dude Russia just pumps out wingers, eh? That's what we're kind of learning yeah, through this draft. Yes. Uh, I, I got to go with Artemi Panarin with, with the Rangers as well. So uh, I, I got Goudreau and Artemi Panarin as my two guys right here. And what more can you say about Panarin other than the fact that they went from rebuilding to contending? And yes, of course, having Tristurkin helps, but what, they just became a legitimate team once Artemi Panarin showed up on, on Broadway. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I guess with my final pick, uh, do I do it? Do I go there? I'm going to go there. Newest Calgary Flame, Jonathan Huberto. 115-point yep. season for uh, for the Florida Panthers last year, now with the Calgary Flames. The guy's just an absolute beauty in the offensive end. I know there's – you know, a lot of question marks about whether or not he wants to play defense and it's something that he's going to definitely have to learn to to love playing under no, Daryl Sutter. So. He's not going to give him a choice. No, he's not. And, and I'm intrigued to see how that plays out and if that's going to affect his his offensive numbers at all. I am interested to see how that works. But now, like, Kadri's over there. He's going to be able to potentially play with and set up Manji Apani. Like, I think that this is going to be a pretty solid squad that they've got there. So, Jonathan Huberto arguably was in the MVP heart race. Uh, a lot of people wanted him to be the heart winner this year. Um, didn't. Went to uh, a guy by the name of Austin Matthews, by the way. Um, but Jonathan Huberto, to get him at eight, I think at this point is a little bit of value. Really good value. So I'm happy with my squad here, man. We're just taking a look at the, at the draft uh, results here. Eight rounds. We picked four each. I had Nikita Kucherov. Mitch Marner, Alex Ovechkin, and Jonathan Huberto as my picks. I like my squad there, Rossi. Yeah, let us know in, in the comments who you have. I'm just making it a little bit easier uh, to go through. You want to read off mine there? I'm just finishing off another graphic to make our YouTube uh, viewing a little bit easier for those who are yeah. going to see the head-to-head. -head. For sure. So you took David Pasternak, Kirill Kaprizov, uh, Johnny Goudreau, and Artemi Panarin. Yeah, I like I like all that. We we clearly led, and now just to quickly finish up, where are we going with the best of the rest? Who would have been your next pick? My next pick, well, the player that I was deciding uh, whether it was Huberto or elsewhere was Patrick Kane. I was deciding if it was going to be Huberto or Patrick Kane. Um, after that, man, it gets like it's it's tough. Could go Marshawn, could go Jake Gensel, who I think is a very underrated Super player underrated. in the NHL. Miko Rantanen is another guy out there, one of the top wingers in the NHL. Probably would have won, you know, with one of those guys in the next couple of picks. Nice. Yeah, I, I like that. What's with the, maybe this last year, an injury out of sight, out of mind, but I feel like Mark Stone was all over these lists his first two years in Vegas. And then all of a sudden he gets his bad back and he also kind of disappeared in the, in the Stanley cup final against, or sorry, the Western Eastern conference final against Montreal when Vegas played them. But he's, he's one of those other guys. The reason his name came to mind, like when you're looking at all around players, just like Mitch Marner, he's a guy who brings that PK aspect and really solid defensive play. Yeah, but like I've always kind of banged the drum that Mark Stone was one of the more overrated players really? in the NHL. And and I know that you obviously probably don't believe that, but I mean this guy, like you said, was all over the list as one of the top wingers in the NHL. The guy had what, like one thirty goal season in his career? 
No. Like the guy, there's not much production. Oh, out. sorry, never mind. He did have one, but he got traded. So it said 28 with Ottawa and then five with uh, with Vegas that year. So yeah, 33 goals. That's career high. Yeah. So one 30 goal season to to you know be up in the categories of the Kucherovs, the passion yep. ask, the up, Marno Vetra. Like those guys, it's it's just not there. Has, has he ever not had a, a point per game season? Like yeah, that same year, the year he got traded. He had uh, 73 points in not a math guy, but about 73 games. Or sorry, yeah. the year before that with Ottawa, 2017-18. And that was a bad hockey team. A bad yeah. hockey team. He had 62 points in 58 games. That's pretty good. And then in Vegas, last year, his last full season, the uh, shortened season, uh, 61 points in 55 games. I just still can't get over the fact that like the goal totals aren't quite there for him. Yeah. He's the so sick defensively, though. Flat. Always at the top in uh, in steals, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. No, Not this sub. year, obviously. Number one this year was uh, who again? Probably Matthews. It He's was pretty awesome. slick defenseman. I mean, when Mark, when Mark Stone's only playing 31, 37 games, I don't think you have to worry about that. But um, how do we feel about Matthew Kachuk? He's got to be one of the next guys on, on this list. Yeah, 40 goals, probably, 100 points. He would be, for me... So I think I would go Kane ahead of him. I would go. And is Stamkos um, a winger now? Like he he's played almost exclusively wing the last couple of years. He has. So I yeah he probably would be can constitute as as a winger. Kyle Connor then, should well, be in the mix. Where's J T Miller? Would you consider him yeah. a winger or is he a centerman? Right. I don't like know. I put yeah. J T Miller ahead of like we're I'm looking at this list that NHL Network put out. I mm-hmm. put J T Miller ahead of <clears throat> ahead of Chris Kreider. Like I, I think yes. Chris. I mean, I, Although, I perfectly would. He did have a 50 goal season, but I don't think he's going to do that again, to be quite honest with you. No, um, no for sure. But I, I got to give some love to my guy, Alex DeBrincat, too. Although Jason Robinson is super fun to watch, too. I think he's just scratching the surface. If we do this in two years, I think we'll be drafting Jason Robertson. Very, yeah, very well could happen. I, Lots of sick wingers, man. We're out with Philip Forsberg, though. Like, he's another player. He's kind sneaky, of been a man. little tiny overrated to me. Yeah, a little bit, but the numbers jump off the page. Like he obviously just got his contract, so now he might be entering overrated territory. But he's a guy. I mean, his start of his career, it's underrated territory. Being traded one for one for Martin Erat, tough play for the Washington Capitals. But I mean, you asked about point per game, eighty-four points in sixty-nine games this past season, and he's been kind of flirting with point per game for a lot of his career. So I, I see the. The intrigue with Philip Forsberg, but he's not a guy who would have been next by any means on my list. I didn't realize how good a season he actually had this year. 42 oh. goals, 84 points in 69 games. Yeah, 100%. All right, I'll take it back. I think he yeah. deserves to be on this list for sure. One goal, no assists in the postseason, but again, nobody was nobody was even going to compete with uh, with them. And he has had playoff success before when Nashville went to the Stanley Cup finally at 16 points in 22 games. And then the next year had 16 points in 13 games. So uh, he can elevate his game when it matters most. But yeah, that was uh, that was a sick year. Although Roman Yossi, I mean, this guy was just putting it on a tee for everyone last year. What do you have? 96 points as a defenseman? Yeah, it was gross. It was actually disgusting. Last question. We'll leave the listeners with this. It was 96 points. 80 games. Missed a couple. 16 game point streak. Does a defenseman, and maybe we'll rank defenseman next draft or draft them. Does a defenseman reach 100 points next year? Yes. Whether you it's... call your shot? Is it Kale? I think it would be Kale McCarr. If he's, if he's healthy, yeah, I think Kale McCarr hits 100 points next year. I Man, Yossi could know. do it too. Like they both could do it. Oh yeah. Well, when we're when we're looking at all defense, and we had this was easily the highest scoring season by a total defense, and like 96 points for Yossi, 86 for McCarr, 85 for Hedman, 74 McCarr for Fox. Injured, dude. Like McCarr only played how many? 77. He missed five. But he was like not a hundred percent. Yep. For a lot of that game, like if you look at these game logs, his first 15 games or so wasn't that stellar, and yeah. then he really had it, just kicked it up a notch and went on a tear in the back half of the year. Well, middle way through the back half of the season, and I mean, we know what Kel McCarr is all about. We don't really so need to, to pump his tires any more no. than it and it already has. 
But see, he had a Slurpee out of the Stanley Cup the other day. <laughs> he would be a Slurpee guy out of the Go Cup. Go Canadian. I love a Slurpee. A good Slurpee. Oh, yeah. Dude, Dude Winnipeg, Slurpee, Slur- Slurpee can- capital of Canada right here, which is ironic yeah. because is in the true? winter. Yeah, it's fact. How is that a fact? What does it mean to be the Slurpee Winnipeg, capital of Canada? Maybe Slurpee. I believe it most. Slurpee is the number one beverage served to women in Winnipeg's maternity wards in the summertime. That's that's what you get when you Google what? It. Oh, here it is. Look, here's an official article from mentalfloss.com. Clearly, very distinguished website. Yeah, reputable for sure. How Winnipeg became the Slurpee Canada of the world. Slurpee capital of the world. Of the world. Of the world. Winnipeg. 7-Eleven honored them with this distinction. That's hilarious. Wow. Well. Winnipeg's got to be good for something. That it's not hilarious. keeping players, but keeping Man. pregnant women happy with Slurpees. Apparently, that's what it's all about. So if you are a general manager and you're trying to target players, I would be like, hey, your they wife, see. when she eventually has kids, you create a family, will be most happy in Winnipeg because – we it's got not even kids. just maternity. That was just, that was top. Here it is. Per capita, Manitoba sells more Slurpees than anywhere else in the world. Um, twice as many Slurpees per capita. At, no, it doesn't even say per capita. The province of Manitoba sells over twice as many Slurpees as anywhere else in Canada. How is that possible? Guess how many they move per month. Slurpees, 7-Eleven Slurpees. If people are like, what the heck are you talking about? They move an average. Of 188,000 Slurpees per month. How is that even possible? I have no idea. How many Slurpees do you, like, when you're walking down the streets of Winnipeg, Rock, do you see people <laughs> walk around with Slurpees all the time? Or what? I need to keep my eye out. I, I haven't, I haven't, really. I've like, been here for one year. Maybe you're the jerk, because when, you know, sometimes it's a nice thing to do when you go to work, right? You bring yeah. some of your coffee, right? Whether if it's yeah. some Starbucks or Tim Hortons. In Winnipeg, is it customary to bring a Slurpee? <laughs> and you just haven't known this? And you've been, you know, the the doorknob who hasn't brought have, Slurpees for the crew at work, and now everyone I talks love. to you behind your back? Yeah, I got to bring this up uh, my next shift on Wednesday at the radio station. Just walk in with Slurpees for everybody. Mandatory Slurpee Fridays if I were you. This is so ridiculous. All right, we got to go. We'll be back next time. We'll we'll discuss who the... uh, the hot dog capital of Canada is next. So we got to have Maybe something we should else. Do. Maybe we should do a Slurpee flavor draft next Ooh. week. All right. I'll have to, I'll have to get the in-depth knowledge of the city of Winnipeg. I'll have my ear to the, to the limestone, big, big uh, limestone exporter here, Manitoba deep cut. But uh, yeah, there you learn something new. Slurpees. That's what Manitoba is <laughs> all about. Limestones and Slurpees. All right. For Mike DeStefano, Locked On Leafs, I'm Ross Levitan. You can find me over at Locked On Senders, of course. Subscribe to Locked On Leafs, Locked On Senders, and check out all the other great podcasts that Locked On produces, like the Locked On NHL podcast. Please join us on our road to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. So go smash the subscribe button, Locked On NHL, over on YouTube. We'll be back next Tuesday. Have a great week, everyone. We'll chat then.